Apple's M1 chips have been astonishing people since their launch in November 2020. There were those who laughed at the thought of iPhone chips powering a computer, and those people have had to eat their words. Industry experts have been scratching their heads, They're wondering how it is that these ARM CPUs are so much faster than many of their x86 PC counterparts. Uh, the simple answer is because they're not standard ARM CPUs, uh, but let me explain. The Apple M1 is a system on chip, not just a CPU. It contains a CPU, but it also contains other components, which in a traditional PC would live on the motherboard or would simply not be present. Uh, we do have CPU cores, and uh, there are two different types. We've got high efficiency cores, which take care of less demanding tasks and use hardly any power. And then there are high performance cores, which look after the more demanding tasks and, of course, use more power in the process. Uh, within the M1, there are also GPU cores to handle graphics tasks, things like drawing the interface and rendering 3D graphics for games. Of course, many PC CPUs also have GPUs on board, but they're not integrated in the same way, and you can't really compare the M1 GPU to PC integrated graphics. Now, also on that M1 chip, we've got a number of specialized processors for performing specific tasks. Now, whereas a general purpose CPU core needs to be able to handle a multitude of different tasks, these specialized processors are built to handle just a few. And as a result, they are very fast and very power efficient. Each time the system can offload processing to these specialized processors, it just means less work for the CPU to handle. What are these specialized processors? Well, we have a video encoder and decoder, which is able to convert video formats in a fast and power efficient way. And that's why the M1 can convert video codecs like H.265 without breaking a sweat, whereas an x86 machine will have to work a lot harder. We've also got an image signal processor, and that speeds up tasks that are commonly done by image processing apps, including things like noise reduction in video. We've got 16 cores dedicated to machine learning, or AI tasks. And this is becoming increasingly important in modern computing for things like computational photography. Uh, you know how the iPhone can produce portrait photography effects by blurring the background and not your subject's face? That's all done with machine learning. And of course, we've got the rise of virtual assistants, so we need accurate voice recognition. That's really important. The M1 also has what Apple calls the Secure Enclave, which handles things like biometric authentication, encryption and decryption tasks, and security. Again, the CPU's not having to do any of that work. And there are other areas taking care of things like MP3 music decompression, uh, communication with the SSD, and controllers for things like Thunderbolt and USB. And then, right next to the system on chip, we have the RAM, with Apple's unified memory architecture that allows all of these cores, along with the CPU and GPU, to access the same memory. So this is not a CPU. It's an entire computer on a chip. And that alone is a key advantage that Apple has, because it can design and control the totality of the system, and then make easy tools that allow developers to make use of all of these features in a consistent way. PC chip manufacturers and system builders simply can't do that. Now think about it. Apple can get its software and hardware engineers to work together in the same room, collaborating with each other day in, day out, to create hardware and software that are perfectly well optimized for each other. Could Microsoft, all of the Linux vendors, Intel, AMD, Nvidia, motherboard and chipset manufacturers all come together to work with the same level of efficiency? Probably not. Now that's not to say that Apple's hardware is only quick because of that software optimization. Far from it. The CPU cores in the M1, codenamed Firestorm, are genuinely faster than equivalent x86 cores. In fact, these cores beat out pretty much everything from Intel, and it's only AMD's new Zen 3 cores that have the edge. But the faster Zen 3 core runs at 5 GHz, and Apple's Firestorm achieves almost the same performance at 3.2 GHz. Remember that power consumption and heat increase exponentially with clock speed, so that Zen 3 core is also using a good deal more power, and it's generating rather more heat than the M1. And Apple, of course, wants power-efficient processors that don't require lots of cooling for most of its models. Apple likes to prioritize the design aesthetic over cooling, and as a result, their machines haven't traditionally been the best thermal performers. 
Imagine though, if you will, an Apple design chip in the Mac Pro tower where you can have a decent cooling solution. That would allow Apple to increase the clock speed on the cores and the results would surely be even more astonishing. How does Apple achieve this feat when it seems that Intel and AMD can? Well, that largely comes down to the architecture. Apple has based their design on the ARM architecture. Now, Apple has always been interested in ARM, and actually they were equal shareholders with Acorn in the early 90s, so they even owned a significant chunk of the ARM company. So this isn't new to them. And indeed, they've actually been working on these chips for almost a decade. ARM CPUs are RISC, or reduced instruction set computers. x86 CPUs are CISC, or complex instruction set computers. And both of these systems have their advantages and disadvantages. And I'm not going to delve into the highly technical in this video. Uh, and that's because I want this information to be accessible to a wide audience. What you need to understand is that there is a fundamental difference in these architectures and how they approach computing tasks. CISC CPUs do something called out-of-order execution. To put this in simple terms, what it means is that the CPU can to some extent choose the order in which it executes instructions. And this enables the system to complete more instructions in parallel, or at the same time. And that makes efficient use of the processor, and it speeds things up. RISC CPUs can also use out-of-order execution. Now, typically, your smaller, cheap ARM CPUs don't do that, but the M1 absolutely does. Apple has focused very heavily on this, and it's implemented considerably more capacity for processing the underlying micro-operations than equivalent Intel and AMD CPUs. And again, both RISC and CISC have their pros and cons here, but in real-world usage, RISC turns out to be more efficient. Now, if all of that still sounds complicated, um, that's because it is. But here's the headline fact. The M1 Firestorm cores can typically process twice as many instructions as x86 cores at the same frequency. So there's no two ways about it. The M1 CPU cores are just genuinely fast and genuinely power efficient in a way that x86 cores simply aren't. That's not all, though. The M1 has a massive advantage when it comes to RAM. First of all, it's very fast. And secondly, it's mounted on the same package as that system on chip. In a traditional PC or Mac, the memory is mounted on the main board, uh, and there's a chipset that then links that to the CPU. Bringing all of this memory onto the system on chip speeds things up. And it also allows all of the cores within the M1 to use the same memory. And that increases efficiency and removes the need to copy memory from one area to another. For example, copying CPU memory to the GPU memory something which has to be done over the PCIe bus in a traditional computer that has a separate graphics card. Now, if we take the PCI 4.0 standard, that offers an overall bandwidth of two gigabytes per second per lane. And typically, you'd install your graphics card in a 16-lane socket, so that gives you a theoretical maximum speed of 32 gigabytes per second. Theoretical, though, because there's an overhead, and many graphics cards aren't PCIe 4.0 compliant. So, in reality, it's probably much less than that amount. In contrast, the memory on the M1 package can apparently hit peak speeds of 68 gigabytes per second. And there's no need to copy data, because the GPU can access the same memory space as the CPU. It's an incredibly efficient way of working, and it's why the GPU cores in the M1 can perform as well as they do, despite being rather inferior to the best that NVIDIA and AMD offer. The M1 also uses the SSD for additional memory space, swapping out areas of memory that are not needed for a time so that more memory space is available for active tasks. And through clever use of memory compression and due to the speed of the SSD, you probably won't even notice that this is happening. True, if you work the 8GB M1 model really hard for an extended period of time, you can get it to slow down. But we've never been able to do that with the 16GB model. And that really just shows how efficient this system is. Now, whether these techniques will compromise the lifespan of the SSD, that remains to be seen. But it's true to say that modern SSDs are incredibly resilient. So combine all of these factors together, and it's easy to see why the M1 machines are so fast. Sure, they have their limits, but most general computer users won't find those limits. And perhaps the most obvious weakness is the GPU performance, which can't hold a candle to NVIDIA and AMD's latest offerings. But I suspect that will come in time. 
And there's a few issues, some niggles with this first effort from Apple. But again, those things will get fixed. Future iterations of these systems on chip have the potential to pull Apple way ahead of the PC competition in a lot of computing disciplines. Uh, so that raises an obvious question. Does Apple Silicon spell the end for x86 PCs? Probably not in the short term, but that's a question I'd like to answer in a future video. And that's it for this video. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you found it useful, entertaining, interesting in some way. Uh, please leave a comment. I love interacting with you guys in the comments section. And why not consider joining our growing community with just one click of that subscribe button. If you're a tech lover, you might want to check out our dedicated podcast channel. So we've moved our weekly podcast over onto that channel. There's a link in the description and we'll pop a link up here somewhere. Uh, and I hope I did enough in this video to earn a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you prefer. But in any case, I hope to see you next time for some more geekery.